You know, when the, when the Romans invaded the temple in 70 A.D., they destroyed it, they ransacked it, they went into the Holy of Holies. And do you know that when they invaded the Holy of Holies, there was no Ark of the Covenant behind the veil? There was no glory behind the veil? Now, do you remember what the Holy of Holies was for? How many of you remember those Old Testament uh, instructions that God gave about the tabernacle? Where God told, God told them to build this place, the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God would rest between the cherubim in such a manifested and pure power that if you entered that veil with any uncleanness, you'd be struck dead. In fact, only one person was allowed to go behind the veil. That was the high priest. And he was only allowed to go there one time per year on the Day of Atonement. And even that day, that man, who was supposed to be the spiritual leader of the nation, was trembling before that veil. They put pomegranates, which would ring like, almost like bells, like rattles, on the fringes of his garment. And they tied a rope around his ankle. Why did they do that? Because if he walked in there and there was any sin or uncleanness in his life, he would be struck dead. And the only way they could get him out was to pull him out by the foot with that rope tied around his feet. Let me tell you something. That was awesome. That was glory. The power in the presence of Yahweh resting in the midst of his people. It was glorious. But now in 70 AD when the Romans ransacked the temple there was no glory but we know actually that the glory had left before that remember when Jesus died on the cross that veil the Bible tells us was rent from top to bottom and we don't read anything about all the priests dying or any kind of glory explosion happening in the in the temple but actually the glory had departed long before that because in, in 63 BC when Pompeii invaded the temple he wrote in one of his diaries he said that he had heard the legends of the holy of holies and the ark of the covenant and he wanted to see it with his own eyes and so he went into the holy of holies and ripped the curtain back and he wrote he said there was nothing there there was no ark there were no cherubims there was no glory it was just an empty room i wonder how long the glory had been Missing from the Holy of Holies. Maybe hundreds of years, we don't know. I've, I've asked some Bible scholars and they say they're actually not sure when the Ark of the Covenant left, when the, the manifest presence of God stopped abiding in that place. But one thing I know for sure, even with the glory gone, for however long it was, the religious system built up around that pretense continued to go on. Can you imagine this with me? Every year on the Day of Atonement, imagine this. I bet you've never thought about this before. Here comes the high priest. He goes through all the rituals, puts on all the garments, puts the pomegranates on his, on his garment, puts the rope around his ankle, has the blood on his hands, and walks between the division of the veil. Nothing is inside the Holy of Holies. There's nothing there. There's no mercy seat. There's no power. There's no presence. But he performs the duty like an actor in an elaborate play. Going through the motions. Doing the duty. And as far as everybody on the outside is concerned, there's nothing wrong. The whole religious system continues to spin on as though nothing is wrong. But inside... Behind the veil, the glory has departed. My brothers and sisters, I can think of no more tragic picture than that one. Yet I see something similar being carried out all the time. All the time. Particularly in the Western world, we have an elaborate religious system. Big churches, big cathedrals. We all know how to go through the motions. We all dress up on Sunday morning. The preacher prepares just as normal and gets behind the pulpit and everything is right. And when people walk out the doors on Sunday morning, they all say to themselves, wasn't that a wonderful service? They pat each other on the back and they go out for dinner. And no one even stops to ask themselves, 
What about the glory? What about the presence of God? Does it even matter anymore? Do we even care about it anymore? Does it even give us pause for thought? My heart is broken so many times when I travel around the nations and I preach in wonderful churches filled with God's people. But it seems as though there's no presence of the Holy Spirit. There's no glory. There's no fire. There's no power. There's no anointing. And I say, oh God, how can we go on like this day after day? Am I the only one that feels like this? My friend, when you realize that the glory is gone, you have one of two things you can do. You can continue to pretend, you can act, or you can fall on your face and say, oh God. Like Moses did. You know what Moses said? He said, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Now, we are living in the new covenant. We're living in, the new, in a new dispensation when the, the presence of the Holy Spirit dwells within the people. We don't go to a, a tabernacle. We don't go to a, um, to a temple anymore. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as Evangelist Bonke has so often preached, he is with us. We don't need to ask for him to come because he never leaves. But my friends, listen to me. There is a difference between knowing the positional reality that the Holy Spirit is in our midst and walking in that reality. Walking in, you see, you can have things that you don't actually use. You can have things that you don't take advantage of. Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, walk in your freedom. You could have freedom and not walk in it. Did you know that? We can have the positional reality that the Holy Spirit is in the midst of his church and yet not walk in that reality. And that's what many of God's people around the world are doing. And you know what it boils down to? A contentment to be satisfied with the program to be satisfied with a system, to be satisfied with a sermon, to be satisfied with religion. And until we become dissatisfied with the status quo, we will never see anything change. Can you say amen? I believe with all my heart that God is getting ready to raise up a people that are not going to be content anymore with systems and with forms and with outward demonstrations and plays. They want the presence of God. And if it's not there, we're going to find out why. We look, at, we look at the crusades where the sick are being healed, and we think that that is some phenomenon. My brothers and sisters, that should be the norm. That should be the norm. We, we have a fire conference like this where the Holy Spirit is going to fall, and people are going to be filled, and we come to it once a year because it's some extra special event. My brothers and sisters, this should be the day-to-day -day expression and experience of the body of Christ. The disciples would not have known a form of Christianity where the Holy Spirit was not pervasive. We talk about how, oh, I've heard people say that the power of the Holy Spirit was for the New Testament church. They needed it because they didn't yet have the Bible. But now that we have the Bible, we don't need that anymore. Nonsense! If the writers of the Bible needed the Holy Spirit, then you do too. If Paul the Apostle needed the Holy Spirit, then you need the Holy Spirit. If Peter needed the Holy Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit. If John, the one who laid his head on the breast of Jesus, needed the Holy Spirit, then you do too. If Jesus Christ himself needed the presence of the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, then we need him too. If he couldn't do it without the Holy Spirit, neither can we. If he couldn't do it without the Holy Ghost, neither can your church, neither can your ministry, neither can your family. Say amen. Sometimes the, the healthiest thing we can do is just acknowledge the reality that, yes, I need the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the best thing we can do is just say, you know what? I am not going to be content anymore just to go through the motions, just to have another service, just to be in another prayer meeting, just to hear another sermon. I am not going to be satisfied until I have received the fullness of what he has. 